All right, we're going to start with the uh, with the lesson today. Um, we couldn't record the lesson last Sunday because of uh, technical difficulties, so we're going to do it today. Uh, we are doing the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses today, verses 1 to 5. And the title of the lesson is The Lamb and the 144,000. So let me read the uh, verses from 1 to 5. Before that, let's start with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for giving us another chance to uh, study your word and uh, convey your word to people that are listening. And uh, the Lord, give us your inspiration, give us your uh, strength, give us your wisdom, so we can share the word properly, the Lord. Thank you for everything that you do for us today and always. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So let me read the, uh, the verses uh, from 1 to 5. Chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written in their, on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters, and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like the harpist playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie, no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Okay, so we're going to... Uh, read uh, every verse and I'm uh, gonna study uh, one by one verse 1 the Apostle John says then I look and there before me was a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads the lamb is pictured as a sacrifice for sin and as a mighty conqueror Revelation uses a special word for lamb the idea of the Lamb as a victorious military leader seems to come from the apocalyptic tradition. John the Baptist pointing, pointed to Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Peter speaks of the precious blood of Christ as of a Lamb without blemish and without spot. In Isaiah 53-7, in the chapter so dear to Jesus and to the early church, we read of the Lamb brought to the slaughter. In Jeremiah 11.9, we read, I was like a gentle lamb that is led to the slaughter. The word gentle is a word that John, John constantly uses and wishes us to see that this is a new conception which he's bringing to man. Now, the Mount Zion in the Old Testament, it was the first, it was first the first fortress, fortress of the pre-Israelite city of Jerusalem, captured by David and established at his capital. Later it became a virtual synonym for Jerusalem. In Revelation, as in Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, it is the heavenly Jerusalem, the eternal dwelling place of God and his people. Then we read 144,000. We read this before. This number stands for those who are sealed and preserved from the great tribulation, which at that moment was coming upon them. The number 144,000 stands not for limitation, but for completeness and perfection. These 144,000 have God's name written in their in the foreheads instead of the name of the beast. It's no doubt that this same group was introduced in chapter 7, uh, verse 4. Though now their work on earth is finished and they're in heaven. In the chapter 7, we read that uh, these 144,000 were like a uh, evangelizing other people and they made a lot of believers after their um, their labor on earth uh, i believe they were they were slain they were beheaded and now they're in heaven praising the lord and then when they were in heaven they were asking the lord when are you going to bring justice to those people who are so wicked and we're going to see justice eventually so the number of the 12 
we said in this uh, in this last paragraph, uh, this group was introduced in 7.4. Now their work on Earth is finished, and they're in heaven at this point. The number of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles represent, representing the church multiplied by 1,000 as symbolic of completeness. Give us the full number of God's true people throughout the ages who are viewed as true Israelites and is the antithesis of the beast followers with 666 on their foreheads, which shows their incompleteness in achieving the divine design for humanity. So instead of having the number of the beast, they have the number of God written in the prophets, so they were protected. Verse 2, the Apostle John continues, And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters, and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like, a, like that of the harpists playing their harps. When he says the sound of heaven, it seems like a could be a description of the voice of God, because he, he, he describes as a, like the roar of rushing waters, here we are reminded of the power of the voice of God, for there is no power like a crash of the waves upon the beaches and the cliffs. And he also continues, like a loud peal of thunder. Here we are reminded of the unmistakable voice of God. No one can fail to hear the thunder crack. Now, also continues here, the sound I heard was like a harpist playing the harps. Now, not only the voice of God is, is, uh, is heard, but also the voice of the martyrs. The 144,000 praise God with a voice like the sound of harpies playing on their harps and singing a new song. The images of harpies and the, and the heavenly host singing emphasize the praise of the saints because of the victory over sin and underscoring the victory over the beast. Now we cover in the previous chapters that uh, these 144,000 were asking the Lord to bring justice to the earth to punish those wicked people. Finally, that is happening right now because now they're praising in heaven because of the victory over sin and then there's going to the victory over the beast because they did not uh, wear the uh, mark of the beast. Verse 3, And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. So only, only the people who have been born again, only the people who are redeemed by, by the Lord can hear the song and can know the Lord. So the, the, this paragraph starts by saying, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. In the Old Testament, the new song was always an expression of praise for God's victory over the enemy, which sometimes included thanksgiving for God's work of creation. Now the new song is sung again, but on the scale, on the higher scale, and for the last time, which is understood carrying into eternity. This means that this narrative in these verses focus not only on ideal description of the church throughout the ages, but also on the end, end of the age, when the last the church has been fully redeemed. Now the, the word redeem, uh, it means uh, that Christ has died for our sins and uh, has bought us at the price. If I can make a comparison, I remember a few years ago hearing a, a sermon by a Pastor Chuck of the Calvary Chapel, and he uh, told a story, if I can remember now, it's about uh, a little girl with a gingerbread name. Uh, this little girl was uh, making a ginger, gingerbread man, and they put uh, a little head and a little body, arms, legs, and uh, eyes, nose, and a mouth. And then it was, it was finished. But then all of a sudden, the gingerbread man comes to life and starts running around the room. And the little girl started chasing the gingerbread man. And the gingerbread man said, you can run, but you can never catch me because I'm the gingerbread man. And he runs out of the, out of the house. And he, she couldn't find him. So the next day she goes looking for him. And she goes by a store, and the store in the window there it was the gingerbread man right there. So she, she goes into the store and tells the owner of the store, I, I want that gingerbread man. I want it. And the, the owner said, well, it's going to cost you five cents. No, no, you don't understand. I, I made that. That's mine. And the owner said, well, it's still going to cost you five cents. So she rushes back home, goes to her piggy bank, and takes five cents and goes back to the store and gives that 
money to the to the owner. So the owner goes to that window, takes the gingerbread and gives it to that little girl. The little mm. girl says, I made you, now I bought you. So that's more or less the price of redeeming. The Lord made us biologically, you know, and also he paid for our sins. So he made and he bought us. We will bought our price, says Paul. So the chorus is so loud that originates for the great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all the tribes and peoples and tongues. The voices are so loud because they come from a multitude of hosts, not only the 144,000, but the full number of the redeemed of all ages. Then he continues, no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. Just as those redeemed by Christ can know the new name of God, which they possess, so no one can learn the song except the 144,000 who have been purchased on the earth. So to learn certain things, you know, to be uh, born again, one must be a certain kind of person. Those redeemed by Christ were able to learn the new song because they have passed through certain experiences. They, they suffer. Those redeemed by Christ have suffered. There are certain things which only sorrow can teach, as, as one poet once said. We learn in suffering what we teach in song. Sorrow can produce resentment, but it can also produce faith and peace and a new song. Those redeemed by Christ have lived in loyalty. It is clear that as the years pass on, the leader will draw closer to his loyal followers and them to him. Then he will be able to teach them things that the unfaithful follower can never learn. You know, the more you, you read the word of God, the closer you're going to be to God. But sometimes you feel like you're not making progress. Um, or, or also, the more you, you read the word of God, the more you realize that there's so much for you to learn. So you can never really be a teacher of the Bible. You can always be only going to be a student of the Bible because you, you will never graduate. Then those redeemed by Christ had made a steady progress in the spiritual growth. This is what we're saying. A teacher can teach deeper things to a mature student than to a mature beginner. And Jesus Christ can reveal more treasures of wisdom to those who day by day grow up into him. The tragedy is so many, of so many, is static Christianity. And Christianity does not move. That uh, it, it just, people some just go to church or are Christian because of habit and uh, does not make any progress. We, we're not talking about perfection, but we're talking about day by day progress. Um, I was like that for many years because uh, even though I was in a religious environment and I was going to church every Sunday, I never uh, understood the magnitude of what is what means to be born again, uh, to be born again spiritually, that you must go through that to be born again. And uh, But that, that term, born again, is being used so much, uh, even for commercial purposes. I know there is a a place in Jersey that's called born again auto sales. So sometimes uh, you diminish the term, but uh, we shouldn't get uh, influenced by that because that's very profound. Jesus Christ said that himself. Since the new song before the throne is about redemption and victory in Christ, apparently only those already in heaven and those redeemed from the earth, like the 144,000, are allowed to learn it. So the narrative of these verses portray redeemed saints praising God for this victory. The redeemed from throughout the world has found divine refuge and final victory. We go to verse 4. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. So the first part of this uh, verse, it says, though there are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. What does that mean? Uh, this, this verse describes the unsold purity of those who are redeemed by Christ. But what does, what does this purity consist? Does it really describe those who in sexual relationship have been pure? 
that cannot be the case because the people in question that are de described are not simply as pure but as, as virgin. That means as those who have never known sexual relations at all. So does it describe those who have kept themselves from free from spiritual adultery? That is, from all this loyalty to Jesus Christ? Well, again and again in the Old Testament, we find that the people of Israel went after strange gods. So this passage does not read as if it was metaphorical. Does it describe those who have remained celibate? That means without any relation with women. There were coming times in which the church glorified virginity and held that the highest Christian life was possible only those who renounced marriage altogether. The Gnostics, the Gnostics were a group that uh, uh, were, were based in uh, intellectual knowledge that only certain people who will go through certain stages of intellectual levels will attain or will, will, will get to know God. And of course, those, they, they were the ones who were in a higher level. So these Gnostics held that marriage and generation are from Satan. One held that marriage is corruption and fornication. Another set up churches for those who were celibates and from which all others were barred. One of the greatest, one of our greatest early fathers, his name was Origen, voluntarily castrated himself to ensure perpetual virginity. This is precisely the spirit which was to bring about the monasteries and the convents, an implication that everything to do with sex and the body is wrong. That is not biblical. To be, to isolate yourself and live in a convent just to be closer to God, that is not biblical. Because what the salvation that you obtain, you cannot keep it to yourself. You have to share it with other people. That's the reason you were saved. Um, when Israel was chosen as a, the chosen people, the reason was so they can share uh, the gospel of, the, of God with other nations, but they did not do that. They kept it to themselves. So the Apostle Paul used to be a, or was a tent maker, I guess during the day, and after work he would go and preach the, the gospel in the marketplace, in the synagogues. So the same thing are with us. When we are born again and come to know Christ and come into a, this a spiritual transformation, we have the obligation and responsibility to share what we do have with other people in the way we can. Some people will go to the streets and preach the word of God. I remember going to a work to New York on a daily basis, and there's a tunnel that on 42nd Street that, comes, that goes from 8th Avenue to 7th Avenue. And in that tunnel, the people will go to change trains. There was one guy every day preaching the word of God. And he was good, but uh, not too many people listened to him. Some people can do that, you know, other people cannot. Other people cannot, cannot you know, uh, um, try to evangelize your family, but th that's that's very hard because they have known you for so long and you are transformed. They, you know, sometimes they, they're very defensive. But anyway, God has given you talents. God has given you this uh, new life and it's your responsibility and and your obligation to share that in, the, in a way that you can. Not everybody can do the same way. Okay, so let's continue with this. So, uh, isolating yourself in a comment on a monastery, that is not biblical. That is far from the teachings of the New Testament. Jesus glorified marriage, saying that for this cause a man left his own family and was so closely united to his wife that they were one flesh, and warning that what God has joined, no man can separate. In his highest teaching, Paul glorified marriage, likening it the relationship of Christ to his church, to the relationship between man and wife. The writer to the Hebrews lays out the lays it down. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And the relationship be, relationship between man and wife, man has to love his wife in the same way that the Lord loved the church. And how did the Lord love the church? He gave his life for the church. So you also have to love your, your wife in the same way that God loved the church. What then are we to say about the present passage? Uh, there are some possible explanations. This may simply mean that the 144,000 were not married, or it may, it may indicate a state of separation into God. 
It could be also a symbolic description of believers who kept themselves from defiling the relationship with the pagan and world system. The word virgins are symbolic of spiritual purity. Redeemed believers will not compromise with evil. They will reject false doctrine and refuse to worship the beast. Descriptions of the redeemed are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste, literally male virgin. The symbolism of this verse could be based on the background of Israelite soldiers being required to preserve ceremonial purity before battle. Sometimes when uh, when the, the Israelites were into into went to fight other people, uh, they were asked to be uh, not to have social relations with the women uh, for a certain period of time. But that was only temporary, just before going to battle. So it might mean that too. It might refer to those who have had who had not had illegitimate intercourse with the great harlot. Preventing defilement was in reference to Christians who have not identified with the uh, idolatrous institution such emperor worship or trade guilt in idolatry. This is the same kind of portrayal where the idea of committing acts of immorality is a metaphor, probably referring to believers tempted to engage in a spiritual intercourse with pagan gods. Likewise, Paul wants believers to be presented as a, poor, as a pure virgin, quote-unquote, to Christ, by warning them to avoid the serpent's deception and pervert the gospel. So, by not committing sexual morality, you know, uh, either with women or or spiritual morality with pagan gods, is what more or less is a metaphor that is called uh, remain virgin. And uh, there's another verse that comes uh, in this uh in this particular verse, it's another sentence that comes from this particular verse, that they say that they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Well, the simplest description or definition of a Christian is simply one who follows Jesus Christ. Follow me, says Jesus said to Philip in John 1, 43, and to Matthew in Mark 2, 14. Follow me, he said to the rich young ruler, and to the unnamed disciple. When Peter asked what was to happen to John, Jesus told him not to bother about what would happen to others, but to concentrate on following him. He left us an example, said Peter, that we should follow his steps. Sometimes when you encounter people that do not know the gospel and that you try to evangelize them or to share the word, they ask you questions like, uh, what about those people who never knew Jesus Christ? Like, um, I don't know, the Incas or the Aztecs or people who were isolated in another part of the world and they never knew Jesus Christ, so they had no chance to repent. Well, the answer to that is that um, Deuteronomy 29.29, there are certain things that God has revealed to us, certain things that are not. That's not our problem, that's God's problem. Uh, we, sh we should be concerned with ourselves, how we are going to be saved and how people around us are going to be saved. But as far as other people, that's, God is a good God, and God will know how to deal with those people. So let's not get uh, involved in those arguments because it's not going to be a, an, an answer that's going to satisfy the other people. Also, the continues, the verse continues, they were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. In the New Testament, the first fruits are the first part of a crop to be gathered, implying a much larger harvest to come later. At times, the term emphasizes only the sanctified or sanctify nature of a sacrifice. The commitment of the 144,000 to God emphasizes they are the, that they are the holy ones set apart to God. However, the continuing offer of the gospel and the harvest imagery also implies that many others will come to faith to Jesus Christ. So the 144,000 are the first ones, but many more will come because they, were being, they have been evangelized. There is a sacrifice to God and to the Lamb. The, words, the word for sacrifice in Greek is aparche. This really means the sacrifice of the first fruits. The first fruits were the best of the crop. They were a symbol of the harvest to come. And they were a symbolic dedication of the whole harvest to God. So the Christian is the best that can be offered to God. Each Christian is a foretaste of the time when the entire world will be dedicated to God. And the Christian is the person who has concentrated his or her life to God. The saints have been purchased from among, among mankind as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. 
In this verse, first fruits could identify a small group of Christians, or especially Jewish Christians, uh, or Christian martyrs, living at various points in the church age, or the very end of history, who are, who are a foreshadowing of a greater gathering of more believers later. So, the salvation of the 144,000 will precede the salvation of a large group of Israelites, who will, who will turn to the Lord at the end of the tribulation. And of course, those people who are going to be saved during the tribulation, they're going to be sacrificed, they're going to be beheaded, they're going to, be, they're going to die, but they're going to be with Christ eventually. In verse 5, which is the last verse of our lesson, it says, No lie was found, was found in their mouths. They are blameless. The first sentence, or the first part of this verse, it says, No lie was found in their mouths. This is a favorite thought in the scripture. The psalmist says, Blessed is the man in whose spirit there is no deceit. Psalm 32 2. Isaiah said of the servant of the Lord, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Zephaniah said of the chosen remnant of the people, nor will be deceit to be found in their mouth. Peter took the words about the servant and applied them to Jesus. No deceit was found in his mouth. That's in Peter 2 22. 1 Peter 2.22 There is something here which we can well understand. Just as we desire friends who are sincere, so does Jesus Christ pe desire people who are sincere. Then it continues, they are blameless. The word in Greek is amomos, and is characteristically a sacrificial word. It describes the animal which is without flaw and so fit for an offering to God. Uh, we know this uh, in the Old Testament, and not only the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, when people will go to a to the temple, to the temple, where they will bring animals for sacrificial for sacrifice to the, to the Lord, and uh, that's when Jesus was upset because the money changers were charging a, an incredible amount of money. Of course, if somebody will buy a let's say a pigeon for five dollars in the market, and uh, they will present it to the money changer or to the priest and they will find a blemish. They will send their own birds for maybe twenty dollars for them. And of course the high priest will get a cut of that. So it was it was corruption then, as is corruption almost uh, everywhere with people who have power. It's interesting to know how often this word is used by Christian. God has chosen us that we should be holy and without blame for before him. The church must be glorious, not having a spot. Or wrinkle when is such thing. Peter speaks of Jesus as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We receive life to make it a sacrifice to God, and that which is offered to God must be without blemish. So the 144,000 were not sinless in their earthly lives, but they were without deceit, which is no lie we found in their mouth, and without fault, they are blameless. That's in regard to the testimony for Christ. In particular, that did not participate in falsehood because they rejected the lie of the Antichrist. They were without fault or blemish because they refused the mark of the beast. So, that was the uh, conclusion of this particular lesson, which is the Laman of 44,000. Now, uh, you know, next week we're going to conclude, we're going to continue with chapter 14. And before I conclude, before I finish, I want to read something that Paul said in Ephesians 1.17. He said, I, kept, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Amen. That, that, so that concludes our lesson for today.